Hey, good afternoon. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Madison. I'm George Hidalgo, club president, and thanks for joining us. So it's a new year, and what a great year 2021 will be. Now, I ask for your patience and commitment to continue to maintain our Rotary Club as one of the largest and best in the world. So if you cannot join us virtually at noon, don't forget that you can watch the videos at any time on our YouTube channel. So in this new year, we have optimism with the vaccines being distributed that will have positive results and eventually allow us to meet in person again. So you figure with three vaccines, hey, they should be enough to work. So isn't that a great thought that we can finally get back to a sense of normalcy? So the end is in sight and we can soon connect, grow and serve together in person. So speaking of connections, we have restarted our coffee connections before Rotary each week. I know today we had several people come on online and, and connect with each other. So if you look at join us at 1130 uh, for the virtual coffee connections, click on the Zoom link in your Wednesday morning email from the Rotary office. There's no other sign in required and no reservations are needed. We hope to see you at next week's coffee connections. So on to our opening music. We open with some music from Elaine Mishler who will play My Country Tis of Thee, followed by Ellis Waller playing All Land Sign on the Backpipes. Take it. Okay, I have some great news to share. We have three former members returning to our club today. We'll start with Jess Cavazos. Now, now she's the president and CEO of the Latino Chamber of Commerce of Dane County. Now, Jess was previously a member of 2018 and 2019, and her sponsor is Charles McLimans. So welcome back, Jess. Next is Bill Haight. Bill is president of Magna Publications and In Business Magazine. So he was previously a member from 2013 to 2018. Now, he is sponsored by Dave Mullenhoff. After we jo also rejoining today is Ashley Powell, who owns Ashley Powell Consulting, which provides career development, coaching, and executive coaching. Now, she was previously a member of our club from 2017 to 2019. Now, Ashley is sponsored by Joanna Birch. So what's fantastic, it's great to have all those uh, former members come on back on board. So Jess, Bill, Ashley, thanks for reconnecting with us, and let's give them a warm welcome. A reminder that our special events fellowship group, chaired by Linda Baldwin, has arranged for a talkback session about Ford Theater's play, the niceties set for February 4th. Now the cost is $30 per person for the ticket to the play, so you can participate in the conversation February 4th. More details and how to sign up will be in Friday's newsletter. We have a community projects announcement. 
Mary Pat Williams is a member of our Community Projects Committee, and she has an important announcement. Happy New Year, fellow Rotarians. We are all looking forward to the new year, but I wanted to take a moment and look back and thank all the participants in our past holiday gift program. As with many events in 2020, it was a challenging year. We weren't able to get together at a luncheon and select a tag, purchase a gift, bring it to the next meeting. And this past year, Goodman Community Center didn't participate in the gift program. So we selected Lucier Community Center and the Salvation Army and committed to providing 100 children's gifts. Thanks to Jane Coster who kept track of all those gift requests and the Rotarians fulfilling them. And thanks to Martha Sullivan, who gave us some online nudges as deadlines neared, and we still had many gifts to purchase. Kim Staddleman and Jeff, too, spent an afternoon at the Madison Club collecting and sorting gifts that over three dozen Rotarians purchased, many multiple gifts. And a special note of thanks to Janine O'Rourke, who purchased an additional seven gifts to make our 100 gift commitment. And then on that December snowstorm Saturday, when some of those gifts were lost in transit, Janine went shopping again, purchased and delivered the gifts to the community center on time for their celebration. For all, it was service above self and doing good in the community. Thank you so much and looking forward to a wonderful 2021. Okay, our community, our community grants campaign chair, Ellsworth Brown, is going to give us an update on our campaign. Ellsworth? Good afternoon. I read in today's Rotary News on December 31st that Majid Samadi was quoted in Spectrum News as telling us that Pantone colors for 2021 are yellow and gray, which equal cautious optimism. Who knew? Well, those of you who read Fashion Color Trend Report, no, because they tell us that these colors lend to a new and more fragmented lifestyle. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but uh, if you're inclined, you now have permission to buy two new shirts, a couple of blouses, or sweaters. If there is optimism in fashion trends, there must certainly be optimism for all of us uh, in the coming year and to those who need our help. So, happier New Year to you all. Our Community Grants Program Statistics for 1229. And George will update this information if significant change has occurred by the time you hear this on January 6th. So far, $126,000 have been given or pledged. That's a wonderful amount of money. 119 have yet to pledge, however, uh, and uh, I urge you to do so by the end of uh, this coming week. Uh, the campaign closes on January 15th, and we'd like to include you all in the list of names of those who have contributed. Uh, if you do contribute at last year's level, we will have added another $27,000 to the money that we have already raised. So please make your gift as soon as you can. Uh, the 1231 Rotary News actually gives you information on how to make a pledge or a gift, uh, different ways to pay, or you can simply call the office. So for those of you who have given, you've given exceptionally generously. Uh, 85 of you have in made increased pledges, many of you significant increases, and that's really special. And you're setting the stage for the 2021 grant making process. So thank you so much for those contributions. You know, I've often thought about why we give. Um, I've been in the nonprofit business all of my career, and um, so I've had many chances to think about this, either giving individually or in this case as a club, an organization. I Googled this for you so that you don't have to, and frankly, I don't recommend it because you have an amazing choice of articles on reasons to give. Some say there are five, some seven, some say there are nine. The count goes up to 16 and more. You can guess many of these, and there's a great deal of redundancy. Some are selfish, like names in print, privileged access to perks, but most are positive and the ones you would expect. Only two or unusual, apparently translated from another language and another culture. Uh, they said that two reasons to give include you might live next door to orphans and some might need money to get their daughter married. 
if you have that need, feel free to apply. No, our deadline is passed. I'm sorry, you'll be out of luck. Um, the four-way test is actually surprisingly silent on charity. It was originally created by Herbert Taylor in the 1930s as a measure of business ethics uh, in his effort successful to save a nearly bankrupt club aluminum products company, a distributing company. Uh, the four-way test was adopted verbatim uh, by Rotary in the 1940s. And just in case it comes up in conversation, it's also used now on billboards from Ghanaian judicial system orders. But we give, I think, for three fundamental reasons, and they're simple, and we know them. It helps people who need it, especially the children who are the most vulnerable. It helps causes we value, but cannot address effectively by ourselves. And finally, we give because we, as a club, and as individuals who have joined this club, are committed to doing the right and necessary thing for the advancement or undergirding of society's social obligations. So once again, thank you and happier new year. And remember, we're yellow and gray. Hey, thank you, Elthworth, for the great status report. I'm glad to see that we're doing well. And I would say the one thing is encourage everyone to participate. Um, I know that this pandemic has impacted uh, every person in a different way. Some are suffering more than others. Those that are doing well, please do everything you can because of this one time that the community needs us. It's right now. Uh, so with the start of the new year, think about what you can do. we got a couple more weeks and then we're done. But uh, do everything possible because bottom line is our community needs our tremendous support. So thank you very much. We'll go on to our member interview series. So, so we continue a monthly series where a new member of our club interviews a longer term member. This helps us not only connect to a new member, but also to hear a little bit more about one of our longer term members. So this month, Emily Greenwald interviewed longtime Rotarian and past president Perry Henderson. First, a little bit about Emily. So Emily joined our club in 2019. And she is vice president of development at Overture Center for the Arts. Obviously, that organization is challenged with the fact that hey, no entertainment is going on. So she was previously a Rotarian in Janesville. Now, Emily holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree and an MBA degree from UW-Whitewater. Now, she is a member of the Association of Fundraising Professionals, of which she is also a past board member. Now, she lives with her husband, Dan, and their two daughters, Edgerton. Now, here is Emily's summary of her interview with past club president, Perry Henderson. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. I'm Emily Greenwald, a newer member to the club, admitted in October 2019. I had the great pleasure of speaking with Dr. Perry Henderson about his Rotary experience. While he may not have consciously sat down and written out his values, upon reflection, Dr. Henderson acknowledges a commitment to service of others has been a guiding light in his life. Dr. Henderson established a national reputation in the late 1960s when he headed a new program at the University of New Mexico Medical School to support the management and delivery of high-risk pregnancies with a focus on serving Indigenous women. Dr. Henderson chose to become a medical professor in part because of his service orientation. His natural inclination is to see the person, not just the condition, and he wanted to inspire students to take the same care with their patients. Dr. Henderson's success leading this program in New Mexico led to positions on national boards and job offers. He and his wife, fellow Rotarian Virginia Henderson, moved their family to Madison in 1976 when Dr. Henderson joined the UW Medical School's faculty in obstetrics. Virginia, who held a doctorate in child psychology, was a well-respected psychologist with the Madison Metropolitan School District. She passed away in 2019 and is greatly missed. Perry was introduced to Rotary in 1981 by his mentor, Dr. Thomas Leonard, a longtime Rotarian. Dr. Leonard suggested it would be beneficial for Perry to recognize there is more to life than practicing medicine. 
At the time, Perry thought of Rotary as just another service club. Two years in, he received a letter from the club stating that his attendance was 48%, short of the 60% attendance policy. He must improve or he would be out of the club. Perry rose to the challenge and made up meetings at other area clubs and sought out clubs in areas when he was traveling for work. In two years, he received another letter from the club congratulating him this time on his perfect attendance and an extended invitation to serve as the committee chair for the attendance committee. By attending other clubs in addition to ours, he got to know all sorts of people he wouldn't normally have interacted with and got to know the activities and good deeds of their clubs. This helped Perry develop a broader appreciation for the reach and impact of Rotary beyond our club. He was impressed by Rotary's commitment to eradicating polio in the mid-1980s. As he and Virginia neared retirement in the 1990s, he successfully encouraged her to join our club, and they traveled to India in 1998 to help administer the polio vaccine to all children under the age of five. There, he connected with a fellow physician and learned more about the disease and Rotary's role in eradicating it. When he returned, Dr. Henderson was the club president at this time, he developed a polio presentation that he shared with over 30 clubs, and this led to him being elected district governor. One special highlight from that time was our club's Polio Plus fundraising campaign to raise $120,000. Dr. Henderson announced a challenge. He would match the first 10 Rotarians who would give $500 to the effort to make them Paul Harris Fellows. In 20 minutes, 10 members had stepped forward and he ended up matching 12 gifts. That year, the club raised $140,000 for Polio Plus. The four-way test and the motto, Service Above Self, continue to be an important part of his life. While networking for business gains may occur, the magic of Rotary is the power of people coming together to work towards goals that are bigger than oneself. It's comforting to know that wherever you go, there are clubs of people who share this commitment to service above self. When asked for advice to newer Rotarians, Dr. Henderson encourages us to get involved in the service aspect of the club to see the impact of our work in the community. We're one of the largest clubs in the country, which means we are able to do more. When traveling, wear your Rotary pin. In the US, Rotary may be sometimes considered as just another service club, but outside of the US, the local, regional, and global impact of Rotary clubs is held in high regard. Wearing your pin can inspire a wonderful conversation and potentially open doors that would otherwise be closed to you. Thank you, Dr. Henderson, for your contributions to medicine, to our community, and to our club. You in Virginia have lived your lives according to Rotary's values, and your leadership and philanthropy has helped shape our club over the years. We are better for your service, which inspires us to continue to serve. Thank you. So on to birthdays. Uh, we've not, we haven't had meetings uh, over the last two weeks, to, so we have a lot of birthdays to celebrate. So now our birthday celebrants can offer a bit of humor or wisdom that complements Rotary's mission. We also encourage members to make an age-appropriate gift to the Madison Rotary Foundation, rounded up to $100 for our club's Students' Age Scholarship Fund. Obviously, as you know, we're trying to increase that participation. So on December 27th, Carol Trone. December 28th, past president, Julie Olick. Also December 28th, Tom Wenzel. December 30th, Brian Chan. January 2nd, Reggie Nazer. January 3rd, Charlie Bertu. Also on January 3rd, Doug Dittman. January 4th, Gary Couture. Also January 4th, Brad 
Mullins. January 6, Justin Hart. January 7th, Matt Darga. January 8th, Mark Westover. Also on January 8th, Alex Izquierdo. So thanks to our celebrants for their contributions to the Madison Rotary Foundation. Please join me in wishing them a happy birthday. And Casey Oakers will play happy birthday on the flute. Take it away, Casey. So normally we go ahead and talk about members of the news, but in the interest of time today, we'll save that for next week. So let's go on to the program. Today's program will feature a panel of four members of our club who will talk about how the pandemic has impacted their industry. And on the panel today are the following members, Julie Alec, who's Community Relations Director for UW Health. And obviously she'll speak about the healthcare field. Ted Balwig, owner of Savory Accents, which grows chili pepper products, represents the farm to trade industry. Jeannie Cullen Schultz, who is co president of JP Cullen, will tell us about construction. And Stacy Nemeth, who is the chief operating officer of the Fior companies, represents commercial real estate. So you would say it's pretty good segments of our uh, commercial base and, and really our economy. So our thanks to Jason Illstrip, president of Downtown Madison Incorporated who will moderate the discussion. Now, this panel discussion was pre-recorded, but they will be available immediately following the presentation for a live Q&A session. So you can link to the Q&A session uh, in the email from the Rotary office. So we look forward to this outstanding presentation. And obviously, we made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund uh, as a way to say thanks for our presenters. And so really appreciate our fellow Rotarians uh, taking time out of their schedule and speaking to us about, hey, what's going on and how, does things, how do things look for 2021? So let's turn it over to uh, the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Team Rotary, for the wonderful introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday season and a happy new year. Thank you very much for joining us for an important downtown Madison Rotary panel discussion on the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects on business. I'm Jason Hillstrip, president of Downtown Madison Inc., fellow Rotarian, and I will be moderating the great session this morning. Uh, we have an excellent all Rotary panel. Uh, as you can see, we've got all members of Rotary here today to discuss the effects of the pandemic, um, adjustments that they've had to make during the pandemic, what the changes will be on business from this pandemic, and what they've learned, what the future looks like. Uh, we've got a great group. We're going to start with our first panelist, Julie Olick, the Community Relations Director for UW Health and current Chair-Elect for MADRAT, Madison's Economic Regional Partnership. Welcome, Julie. How are you this morning? I'm great. Thanks, Jason. Wonderful. Next, we have Jeannie Colin schultz co-president of J.P. Collin Construction Company and a member of the St. Mary's Foundation Board of Directors. Good morning, Jeannie. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. Thanks, Jason. Perfect. Perfect. I will say this. Noontime has me confused. I should, it's good afternoon or good morning, right? Whichever one applies to both of us. Next up, we have Stacy Nemeth, the Chief Operating Officer with Fiori Companies. Fury Companies is an outstanding full-service real estate and development company here based in Madison. She also is the most recent past chair of the Downtown Madison Inc. Board of Directors. So yes, she is my boss. So no pressure there. Good morning, Stacy. How are you? Good morning. Thanks. Nice to be here. Nice to be. And last but certainly not least, we've got a great friend to Rotary, Ted Balwig, the president of Savory Accents, a, a family-owned, excuse me, Food production company based in the Madison area. Before uh, joining Savory Accents, Ted had a long career at the Alliant Energy Center. Good morning, Ted. How are you? I'm great. Thank you, Jason. 
Perfect. Well, welcome everyone to this panel. This is a important discussion. COVID-19 has had vast effects on businesses. We've got four different leaders from four distinct areas of our Madison economy to talk about what is happening here today. We're just going to get right into it. How has COVID-19 affected your business? We're going to start with Julie. Obviously, a big question working in healthcare. There have been large and wide effects uh, from COVID-19 on your business, on your health, on healthcare itself, business too. Julie, how is everything at UW Health? Yeah, I'll try to um, make the biggest points. And I will note that we're, we are recording this the end of December. So by the time we see this in January, my answer could be different. Um, <laughs> I think the biggest thing is that this pandemic has really brought our mission, vision and values out. Um, it's caused us to really and truly live what we say we believe, a remarkable health care. And so we see that every day. Um, that's been a tremendous uh, positive, I think, from this. But yet, yeah, I'll just throw out a few um, things that COVID has, has really meant for us in terms of changing. We have had to be extremely nimble. Um, everything from when we had our first patient come in February um, to when the vaccine arrived, um, we've had to move very, very quickly. And for an organization of our size, much more quickly than we ever, ever expected. So that's been one observation of mine. We have been challenged to be more patient and family centered than ever. And that's been hard. We can't have visitors. So how do we use technology to connect people? How does our staff really become family for our patients? And then using telemedicine so that we can be there for patients who can't or won't come in to see our providers and keeping our providers safe. So those have all been um, ways that we've both been nimbled and, and really lived our values. Um, innovative, working with the School of Engineering on new PPE that came super quickly um, in the spring. And I'll just say um, two more big messages. One is um, transparent communication has been essential to our ability to function during COVID and really understanding that our leaders have to be front and center in front of all of our employees every day, every week. We meet as incident command every day, every week. So we all really know what's going on from our financials to our PPE supply, having a dashboard that everyone can look at. And the other is collaboration. We've leaned into the collaborations that we have built over the years in ways I cannot even describe. Again, from the University of Wisconsin to our partners in the community, um, supporting our employees, supporting our patients and families. And most of all, listening to our experts who are advising on what to do and really asking people to make very difficult choices for themselves and their businesses to keep us all safe and hopefully get this get us out of this sooner rather than later. Julie, you, you, you bring up collaboration and innovation. I think it's so important because you guys have gone through so much. I, I didn't realize until um, I heard from, from UW Hospital President Rick Ransom that COVID is now the third leading killer, right, of people. And you have to layer that onto the work that you were already doing with, with cancer, with heart disease and all these other issues. You know, your, your team must be very taxed. And I, I just have to say, you know, from the yeah. whole community, thank yeah, you work to everyone. Have. Yes, and, and, but thank you, because without you, we wouldn't be able to continue with the amazing healthcare you provide. So Julie, you know, thank you to you and your team. So a group company like, J.P. Cullen, Jeannie, who does a lot of work in healthcare, right? Who does a lot of work in these uh, businesses that are having different outcomes in 2020. Uh, what does what the construction scene look like now as opposed to 2019 where things were very robust, right? There were a lot of projects happening. What, what are you seeing? Uh, how has it affected your business at J.P. Cullen? Yep, that's a great question, um, Jason. And I just want to say to Julie's point about the, the mission, vision, and values, we have the exact same thing as um, that really looking internally and um, being um, all on the same page there and really um, surrounding our team was at the forefront as we started in this pandemic. And it's really 
in my opinion, set us up to be successful in the construction market, which has been very challenging to, to Jason's point. Um, I have to start by saying I'm very thankful that Governor Eber, Ebers um, deemed us an essential service. So we have been able to come to work every day since March to be able to service our clients like UW Health and the schools and the university. Um, so that's been great, but I will say um, it's been slower than normal, which is, which is no surprise. I think um, for JP Cullen, as well as the whole industry, we would say our very strong backlogs that we had procured leading up to this year is what has been allowed us to stay um, busy, so to speak, and keep the projects moving. My concern is when we're in 21, 22, 23, because there has been a lag in architects putting out projects for bidding, um, negotiating commercial projects um, coming out or getting into the design phase. So. That'll be interesting because I don't think we've truly really felt the impact as an industry right now. Um, just for our company, we had pretty significant jobs that were delayed. Um, we're call it April 1st, we lost about 25% of our business plan for the year and had to adapt and figure out um, what that meant for the 2021 um, fiscal year, which we start April 1st. Um, but I will also say I'm thankful that for the state of Wisconsin, they continue to put out very large projects for bid. Um, and the only delay that they had was about a month as they figured out what virtual bidding looks like and how they were going to do their very transparent process over um, we submit it via email and then they read it. It's, it's really worked out well. So I'm very thankful for the state that um, has been kind of filling in the gap as healthcare has been slower and other markets have been, been slower. So definitely a challenge. We're learning to be nimble, just like Julie and the, the healthcare team. So I think that nimbleness and pivoting is, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah uh, pivot, the word, the, the word of 2020 will be pivot. And I've noticed that people have to pivot again and again. And again, just don't know what the new challenges are. And, and speaking of new challenges, I'm going to go to Stacy. Uh, if you're a company, you know, owns, operates, manages, de- and works in development and real estate, particularly a lot of commercial, and a lot of conversation about workforce, right? A mm-hmm. uh, couple of us here are at home. Uh, we're working in different environments. How has COVID-19 affected the real estate market now? And what do you see in the future, particularly on the commercial side moving forward? What are your tenants uh, doing now and what are they looking for uh, in the next few years? Well, I do think, you know, I've, I've been at Fiori companies for 23 years and this is by far the most challenging um, circumstances we've ever had. And we've always tried to consider ourselves a partner in our tenants business. We're not just their landlord. We'd like to be their business partner. And n- never has that been more evident than right now because it requires us working together with our tenants to figure out how to get them through to the other side, especially when you start talking about restaurants and retailers who were completely shut down and don't have the financial reserves that a larger company like Fiori or, or JP Cullen would have. So, you know, they didn't have the runway that, that larger companies might have to make it through. So it really became incumbent upon us as their landlord to try to find creative ways to help them through that situation while at the same time having to go to our lenders to get permission for every single one of those concessions you want to make and um, you know, fighting for your tenant's survival, but at the same time knowing that you still have your own financial obligations to make. Um, so that's, it's been in, incredibly challenging from that standpoint. From a, from a tenant operations standpoint, you know, we went in a 24 hour period from having fully occupied office buildings with hundreds of people to having no one in the buildings. And, you know, like Jeannie said, we were lucky to be deemed an essential operation because these buildings don't just get turned off overnight. And so our staff was still there every day. And our company, I think, Hopefully we find that this was the, the right decision. We made the decision to move forward with a lot of projects that we could do more easily when the buildings were not fully occupied. So some large capital type projects that we would have done later in 21, 22, and 23, we accelerated and have done over the last six months. Um, we did that not only because it was easier when tenants weren't there, but we also wanted to try to get our contractors some business and keep them working, as we all know, it all trickles down. If we stop doing work, contractors don't have work, 
you know, it trickles down through the entire economy. So we've tried to do, you know, our small little part to keep things moving and do projects that, you know, would be a real hassle for tenants when they're in the building. So we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make our buildings as safe as possible when people come back. We've invested a significant amount of money in making everything touchless. So you can walk into any building without having to touch a doorknob, without having to touch anything in a bathroom, you know, and we are starting to see a lot more people coming back into the office. It's not it's not regular, you know, it's not everyone's in the office every day, but people are starting to come back a day or two a week. Um, so we are seeing increased traffic, but in the long run, you know, I think obviously retail and restaurants are the, are the biggest concern in the short run. In the long run, as office leases start rolling in 21, 22, 23, I think it's going to be very um, challenging for companies to decide how much space do they really want. And, you know, we're starting to see the impacts that people realize their workforce can be effective from home. But I think there's a real loss of collaboration and communication and teamwork. So people do want to get back in the office. This, you know, for, for many years, we've had a trend towards trying to put more people in less space. And now no one wants to sit nice up close with their coworker. <laughs> so it, it's going to be a real challenge for companies and their landlord partners to figure out how to navigate over the future. No, I am give it to Ted on two questions. Um, Ted has a long history in tourism, hospitality. Um, obviously, as Stacy mentioned, you know, retail restaurants, visitor locations, theaters have really been hit hard, including your former employer. Before we ask questions about, about savory accents in the, in the food production, Ted, how have your friends in the hospitality sector been doing? It really seems like it's been hit very hard, uh, almost as hard as any industry in our local economy, but nationwide. It, it sure does. Um, I would think they were the, the most impacted. Uh, most of my friends in the industry are out of a job and have changed. Many have left the industry. And I think that's going to be the biggest challenge is that a lot of the experience of the industry is going to uh, evaporate and they'll have to start over. Um, the event business pretty much, uh, it ended. It really, except for COVID testing and some, you know, some nonprofit work, Lion Energy Center shut down and has been. Um, it's, it's kind of ironic. Uh, because I, as Savory Accents, uh, had worked with the Dane County Farmers Market to relocate to Willow Island at the Alliant Energy Center as a way to keep the market going and still be safe. And that, that project has worked really well, but I find it kind of ironic that I was able to connect my former employee with my current organization. So I'm glad that works. Savory Accents is actually a second generation family business that I've developed uh, mostly as a side business, but over the last 10 years as a primary business. Uh, we're in the seasoning, sauces, and spices business. We've targeted uh, Milwaukee, Chicago, and Madison in that triangle as our primary business focus. Um, we, we, we um, I would say home chefs and restaurants have been our primary uh, customer. And so most of the time we reach those customers through Farmers markets in Milwaukee, Chicago, and Madison. And when that ended, uh, that was about 95% of our business. So, uh, like some of my other fellow vendors at markets, I had a couple of choices. I could shut down, uh, we could take a sabbatical, or we could figure it out. And uh, thankfully, we were deemed an essential business. So, as uh, we looked at options, fortunately, we've always looked at how we can grow and develop the business. So April 7th, we launched a brand new website with Shopify. Um, we worked with other vendors to, we're, in, we're part of the largest CSA in Chicago, which is about a thousand, maybe 1200 weekly deliveries. Um, that has really helped. So we have figured out how to do business um, and I really, at the end of the day, I would have to say the number one reason we've uh, survived and even thrived has been our customers. Uh, we listened to them. They liked our products. The, the real issue became logistics. How do we 
figure out how to get products to people when they can't come to see us at farmers markets. Uh, our e-commerce has grown four times uh, what it was a year ago. Um, we opened a farm store here at the farm and uh, visitors anywhere from three to a dozen a day really had an impact on our bottom line. Um, specialty food stores that are still open like Brooks Cider and Mount Horb and others have picked up some of our distribution. Uh, we work with other farmers. Uh, there's an organization called Madison Farmers Unite and they do weekly deliveries. So it's interesting that we went from zero business to at the end of the year, it looks like we'll be we ended up about 95% of what we had last year. Um, what I find really quite interesting is the things that we learn when we are forced to pivot and change our business model. Uh, we know that uh, so let's say things go back to normal in July or whatever next year. Many of these methods of reaching our customers are going to continue. People are still going to want to come to the farm. There is a, a definite interest in knowing where your food comes from and seeing it grown, meeting the farmers. We don't think that's going to go away. I do think e-commerce is going to continue to grow. Uh, the convenience of ordering it today and getting it tomorrow is it's just too much. People are, they love it. And uh, as we know from shipping in the last month, um, they're backed up. They have, they're going to have to change their infrastructure to keep up with the demand. So I, I do see a lot of positive in what's happening. Uh, obviously, we, we, uh, we don't want to go through this again. And I don't think anybody anticipated the disruption in the economy and the way we do business. But we do have to find those uh, threads of positive and build off of them to weave a whole new uh, system. And um, farmers markets will come back. People want that interaction. They do want to the social, but it's going to be a while. And it's going to be a different, uh, especially initially. One of our top ways of recruiting new customers was sampling. And I don't think we've sampled any of our products since March of 2020. So it's, it's just been a really interesting, I would say, stressful. Um, personally, I've had to figure out how to deal with a lot of stress because you try 12 things and one of them works. Uh, and you have to try 12 different things because you don't know which one's going to work. And so as a small business, um, we have figured it out at least so far. Uh, I also want to give a lot of credit to our employees. I hire a lot of college students. And um, initially, uh, when they couldn't go back to school back in March and April, they this year I had veteran college kids, if there is such a thing, people that had all had worked here one, two, or three years before. And it really helped us keep the business going while I was out seeking new avenues of distribution. And so uh, it's, I wouldn't want to do it again, but it's certainly a, a learning experience. What said, I think it highlights, you know, how, we have to, with the ingenuity and what, what Julie brought up, the creativity and the innovation that has to all of these businesses. It's great to hear your business has come back up, but in a completely different form than it started in uh, 2020. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing in the overall sector is that COVID accelerated many business trends that were already happening in the market, right? Uh, more delivery service, um, it expanded use of e-commerce. In fact, Many people thought that by 2025, 25% of all retail transactions would be uh, through e-commerce. Now they're saying it's already accelerated so much that it's a third of all transactions by 2025. So that leads us to the question, I open this to all of you. What are the permanent changes you will all see from COVID-19, that, that things that have worked or permanent changes for your companies that you will continue to use forward in 2021, 2022? Let me throw in one quick one because I think this is, Cash is going away. Even at farmers markets where cash was king, he, now people will come up and say, do you accept cash? It's so strange <laughs> to see how quickly uh, Square and PayPal and Venmo, and, and if you don't have those, uh, people may not buy from you because they, one, they're learning how to survive without carrying cash. And two is some, and, and I suspect that there's a lot of truth to it, that a lot of cash is not that sanitary. But uh, cash is going away, and it's going quickly. I think one of the changes that will continue is the just rapid, rapid adoption of technology. 
um, at Fiori, we're usually a, a little slow on the technology adoption, and we have accelerated so many things over the last six months that we wouldn't we would have done over the next five years probably, uh, just to make it it's simpler to to work remotely and to collaborate with one another. And I, I think those things will continue because we have found some great tools that we are really finding great benefit from. The other thing that I think will continue is flexibility for our workforce. You know, we have we have found and it's been proven that our employees can be productive from a lot of different locations and that the typical eight to five workday sitting in your desk is probably going to look different. You know, we don't we don't want everyone working from home all the time. We want people in our office collaborating with one another. But it, I don't think it will ever go back to the same way it was before. I think for, for us, we're, we're a little different in that we are uh, bricks and mortar, and we can't necessarily transition our business and our service to, to e-commerce or um, doing it remotely. Uh, uh, three quarters of our company is our men and women in the field and our craftspeople mm -hmm. that have to show up to work every day and cannot do it remotely. So our focus is really about how do we um, adapt to this new environment, whether it's job site protocols. Um, thinking about, you know, more hygiene, more sanitization, how can you socially distance um, in an existing space that might only be a thousand square feet and you have 15 to 20 different subcontractors that are working in there. So being strategic about, you know, when you take break time, lunch time, where and all of that. Um, the other thing um, besides the, the technology that Stacy mentioned is just communication. We've learned um, communication has always been huge for, for our company, but frequent positive communication for our, our teams has been very beneficial. And we've, we've started doing town halls um, this spring and we do them once about once a month where George, my brother, my co-president and myself get on a, a Zoom meeting and we talk to the entire company about you know, what's going on, what's out there, what changes have been um, in place, whether it's COVID related or business plan. Um, and that's been huge, just them being able to see our faces, having boots on the ground, being present. Um, and I think that will for sure continue because we've gotten such positive feedback about that visibility and continuing to keep our teams updated. I can only underline each and every one of those comments um, from a healthcare perspective, um, very much agree. Um, I will add from a healthcare perspective that telehealth is here to stay for sure. We've seen not only a great acceptance of it, but um, better uh, attendance. People keep their appointments. Um, you don't have to find a babysitter. You don't have to drive in a snowstorm. Um, and we thought our older patients would um, be less accepting of it. And they're the most accepting of it because they're often the least eager to make the drive. <laughs> so that's been a really big eye opener that will definitely stay a part of our world going forward. And I'll add one more that is a personal observation, which is I think loyalty is here to stay. You know, when Ted talks about his experience with his business, I made sure I was at the farmer's market here on the west side every weekend um, and shopping at my favorite vendors and making sure I'm going to my favorite restaurants mm -hmm. and small businesses and, um, and large businesses too. <laughs> you know, just trying to be very mindful that we are all so interconnected. Mm -hmm. And we, I think as Rotarians, understanding our obligation and sense of community um, and service above self has never, ever been more true. And I hope that that remains um, a, a, the biggest takeaway from all of this is that we are all in this together and we all really need each other. Really well said. I mean, you know, unfortunately, businesses. And so many employees and so many of our community have gone through so much and suffered so much, but there's ways that we can help. And shopping locally, uh, purchasing your, your food locally, restaurants ordering, deliver, buy the items from Savory Accents, you know, use local contractors like J.P. Cullen. You know, those things absolutely matter and keep going. And I, it, 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 there is light at the end of the town. So we only have a minute or two left for each of you. There's a, uh, there is some promise with the vaccine uh, on the horizon and starting to be administered. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel. 
What have you learned? Very quickly, 30 seconds each. What have you learned from your experience in COVID-19 that uh, gives you a positive feeling for the future? I'll just start with the, go ahead. I would just piggyback on what Julie so eloquently and well said is just people and loyalty. Um, I'm, I'm so proud of our company, our community, um, our teams for how we've, you know, there's opportunities for improvement, but as a whole, we've really banded together and we're doing everything we can to keep our doors open, to keep our, our people going to work and getting a paycheck and supporting our community. And it's all about the people. And if you have great people and a great culture, you will, you will persevere what, regardless of what's thrown at us. And um, I sure hope there's never another pandemic in my, my lifetime, but I'm, I'm proud to say we've, we're, we're working through it and we're going to get there. So thanks for the, the opportunity to speak today. I'll jump in and say people are kind and giving. Um, whether it's our staff working extra shifts, doing amazing things for patients, but the outpouring, the unsolicited outpouring we have seen from this community in healthcare has been amazing. From dollars to thank you cards to signs outside our buildings to emails, to um, doing the right thing. And if you can, staying home um, has, has really um, been a bright light, an absolute bright light in all of this that I firmly believe will continue to shine. I think the creativity of the human spirit, and it has been amazing to see what people are doing to pivot their business, their lives, their families in the ways that, that we're finding to connect with one another and, and keep those relationships strong, even when we might not be able to be together. And, you know, just as Ted talked about the creativity of business people to do their business in a different way has been amazing. And I think really speaks to the human spirit. And I would just uh, kind of piggyback on that, ask for help. I found it phenomenal that people mm -hmm. wanted to help. And like last fall, we couldn't get our crops in. And I had five customers volunteer for two weeks straight to come out and harvest. Uh, you know, in the past, I would say, no, no, I got this. But I realized that I couldn't do it by myself. And it's the same with other vendors, the collaboration. Uh, you just Sometimes you just have to ask for help. You can't always do it by yourself. So that would, I, I think that would be my takeaway is don't be afraid to ask. Well, as we enter a new year, 2021, we hope it's all a turning of the page, but it's great to end on a positive note. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Jeannie Collin, co-president of JP Collin, Julie Alla, community relations director for UW Health, Stacey Nemeth, chief operating officer with Fiore, and Ted Balwick, owner and founder of Savory Accents. Thank you so much for joining us. Please stay on. We're going to have a question and answer session in a few minutes with this great crew of fellow Rotarians. Hope you all have a wonderful week. We'll see you in the question and answer. Thank you for joining us. So thank you for the informative presentation. Now, for those who are interested, we will now move to the live Q&A session via Zoom. You can see the link in the chat or find the link in this morning's email from the Rotary office. So thanks for everyone who attended today's meeting. We are adjourned. Thank you.